back, I want to give people a little vignette of yours and my relationship. We're sitting at a wood-paneled Davos-like bar, and there's a very famous Secretary of Treasury sitting somewhat near us, and you and I walked through the excesses of 05, 06, and you nailed 2008. Are we there again? Yes, we're here again, but in addition to the economic, monetary, and financial risks, and there are new ones. Mm -hmm. Now we're going towards stagflation, like we've never seen <clears throat> since the 70s. In the book, I point out that there are also geopolitical risk, like we're on a confrontation with some revisionist powers like China, Russia, Iran, or Korea that are challenging the geopolitical order mm -hmm. of the US and the West, and that's going to lead potentially to conflict. There are environmental risks that are very severe. There are health risks coming from pandemics, and there is a relation between global climate change right. and pandemics. There are technological risks coming from AI, machine learning, robotic automation, destruction of jobs. There's a backlash in, against globalization, and we're going to go to a world that is deglobalized. There are political risks. We have polarization and we have radical extremist party of the extreme right and extreme left coming to power, both in advanced economies and in emerging markets. And on top of it, we have amount of the debt like we've never seen before, explicit debt well, that's and implicit as that's well. That's right where I want to so go. So it's a confluence of all these mega threats, Lipsky, 10 of them together. Lipsky at IMF yeah. was heated about the debt buildup. On the yeah. back of your book, you've got a guy named Rogoff from Harvard, Bremer of Eurasia, Dr. Alarian from Cambridge, Martin Wolf, always wonderful at the FT. And at the very top, the quote of the season from Taleb, the gravity's return to the physics. We've got a higher real yield now. We've got a risk-free rate now. What are the ramifications in our economic system that the gravity's return to our physics? Well, there were many insolvent agents in the economy because uh, private and public debt as a share of GDP has gone from 200% to 350 globally between 2000 and today. In advanced economies, more like 420 and rising. In the US, is now higher than after the Great Depression and after World War II. And we're not out of a Great Depression or a major war. And until now, even if you had zombie households, corporates, banks, shadow banks, governments, countries, they were built out. They were built out during the global financial crisis, zero policy rates, negative quantity easing, credit easing, and even during the COVID crisis, many of them were fragile. They were built out again. We went back to, get, to do even more of the same. This time around, instead, is different because we have so much debt and central banks like the Fed have to increase interest rates to fight inflation. So the zombie institutions are gonna go bankrupt. That's why not only we're gonna have inflation, and stagflation, but we'll have a stagflationary debt crisis. In the 70s, we had negative supply shock, 73, 79, but we had very low debt ratios. So we didn't have a debt crisis in advanced economies. We had one in Latin America, Argentina, Mexico, Brazil borrowed too much in the 70s. When Volcker jacked up pre interest rates to 20%, they went bankrupt. After the GFC, we had the debt problem, mortgage debt, housing debt, bank debt, and we had a debt crisis, but it was a negative aggregate demand shock, and therefore we had low inflation and deflation. Today, we have the worst of the 70s with a massive amount of stagflationary negative supply shock. In the book, I identify 11 new ones over the medium term. And at the same time, we have debt ratio like we have never seen before. So we get stagflationary debt crisis. Well, don't give us the 11 themes, John, or we'll be here all day. <laughs> I was waiting for the 11 to before I jumped in. You used this phrase in there. I could no, tell yeah. you in, this, in the soundbite sure about the 11. Could, but I'm not going to give you the time. You said zombie institutions. Yeah. Where are they? And are you talking about countries now and not companies, not households, not private balance sheets? Are you talking about countries, sovereigns? Oh, uh, well, there are plenty of sovereigns that are in trouble. Uh, in emerging markets, we know what has happened in Lebanon, what has happened in Zambia, what has happened in Sri Lanka, and there is about 40 of them that the IMF and the World Bank said that they're on the verge of having a debt crisis, severe debt crisis because of what's happening. And look what happened to the United Kingdom that now has started to be priced in like an emerging market with the fiscal stimulus reckless, forcing the Bank of England essentially to monetize it, and then the currency falling and rates going much higher until they reverse themselves. So it has happened in Greece, it's happening in the UK, it could happen in Italy. Of course, we have a large number of not only emerging markets that are at risk, but also also of advanced economies that are at risk. So over the last 10 years, we've had a series of counter-cyclical circuit breakers. Yes. Fiscal had the capacity to do that. Yeah. Central banks had the capacity to do that. Yeah. Seemingly, we're questioning the capacity of those institutions, central banks, sovereigns to be able to do so this time around. You offer solutions in this book too. What are they? 
Well, for every one of these mega threats, there is a solution. But then there are two final chapters, one about a dystopian future where all these threats materialize, they feed on each other, and it's not just the end of the world economy, it could be even global war. And there is a less dystopian future in Chapter 12 where we have the policies nationally and internationally that lead us to a better outcome. The problem is there are both domestic political constraints and geopolitical political constraints to achieving the best solution. And I'll give you an example of global climate change. Domestically, in this country, half of the country doesn't believe into it. Two, there is a conflict between generations. The young people care about the future, the elderly care less. At the international level, there is a free rider problem. If a country cuts emission to zero, nobody else does it, then they don't get benefit and only the cost. And now because of geopolitics, we are telling India and China, you should cut your emission now to zero in the next 20 years. But we created a problem in the last 200 years. 90% of the stock of emission came from advanced economies. And now we're telling them, don't grow, don't become rich, because there is a problem. It's true, the flow of new emissions coming mostly from China and India. So there are four elements of conflict, two domestic and two international, that they, they essentially imply that we're not going to find the right solution. So there's lots of greenwashing, green wishing, green fig leaves, lots of ESG is just talk and no action. Glasgow COP was just a total failure and or a slow motion train wreck. Which goes to your point, John, about electric vehicles that 9, are 9,000 pound EVs. 9,000 pound EVs in the United States because they are green. There is an issue, though, going forward with the central banks and whether a lot of your thesis, Nouriel, is is predicated on their inability to go through with what they need to do to get inflation down. Is that your base case? Is that the most likely outcome? Yeah. Right now, all central banks are playing tough and talking tough and acting tough, hawkish, because they have a problem of credibility. But in my view, there are two problems. One problem is that they, if they try to get to 2% inflation, they cause a recession. And this recession is not going to be short and shallow. It's not going to be garden variety. It's not going to be plain vanilla. It's not going to be two quarters of negative growth, and then inflation collapses, and they can ease again. In the book, I explain all the reasons why it's going to be a severe recession, because of the debt ratio, because we're going into fiscal and monetary tightening. And at the same time, you not only have an economic crash, you're going to have also a fiscal crash. We're not only in fiscal dominance in this game of chicken between Treasury and central bank, where in what the folks at the Bank of International Settlement call a debt trap. There is so much private and public debt that if central banks try to fight inflation, they cause a crash of financial markets and not just the stock market. That's the least important. Credit market, bond markets, and that crash and financial crash feeds on the economic crash and vice versa. And therefore, they're going to wimp out and they're going to blink. And the first one was the Bank of England. The Fed is going to do the same. The ECB is going to do the same. Have you been surprised that we haven't seen some sort of catalyst, some sort of financial stress so far, given how quickly, quickly the Fed has already hiked rates? Well, we have not yet seen it. Some people worry that some major financial institution, not in the U.S., may go bust. I think that the financial strains are going to become more severe because right now the Fed is on the way to go from 3 towards 5 percent. You already have a stock market down 25 percent, Nasdaq even more, public REITs 33 percent. You have the crash of MIMI, of SPAC bubble, of the crypto bubble, private equity, venture capital, growth. Everything is down. Credit is down. Leverage loan market is shutting down. CLO market is shutting down. And the only thing that used to be safe, there were government bonds. Now the price is correlated positively with equities. Because when inflation is rising, you lose money on your equity side, you lose money on your bond side. Yields have gone from one to four. And the price action downward on bond has been worse than in equities. 30% losses. So any 60, 40, 70, 30, or risk parity portfolio lost money on both hands. Yeah. There was nowhere to hide. Even cash gave you a negative real return because of inflation. There you're are other alternatives that can protect you against this tail risk, but they're not the traditional ones. You're a man of high conviction. We know that. You've also got some very smart friends. Have you had any pushback to this book that's convinced you of absolutely anything, made you rethink how bad things might be and possibly made you think that possibly they could turn out better than you think? Uh, honestly, everyone who has read it at any level has said that the threats you're talking about are all too real. Of course, there may be solution to them, and I discuss them chapter by chapter and in the final chapter about the less dystopian future. But think of it this way. I have gray hair. I, I grew up in the 60s, 70s in, in, uh, in Italy. 
At that time, did I ever hear about climate change? There was sure. never a concept. Did I worry about the nuclear war after the town between Soviet Union and US? There was nothing. Did I worry about AI destroying most jobs? We're in the AI winter. We had the stable democracy. We didn't have pandemics. Last time around was 1918. We had low debt ratios. We had low implicit debt because there was no aging of population and all that funded liabilities. There were no major financial or economic crises. This is a quantum shift. There was a period in 1945 and the mid-80s that was something of a stable period of global prosperity, welfare, peace, and so on. Today, these are threats that did not exist. And those threats are more similar to the period between 1918 and 1945, when we had World War I, World War II, the Great Depression, trade war, financial crisis, inflation, hyperinflation, deflation, Nazis, fascists in Germany and Italy, Fran uh, Spain, and, and Japan, and we had World War II, and then we had the Holocaust, and then we had the Korean War. Yeah. As, as Neil Ferguson on Bloomberg is saying right now, in his column this week, he says, we'll be lucky if we repeat the 1970s, because it's more possible we end up like in the 1940s, meaning he's talking about World War III. I love Neil, but can we be clear? That wasn't a column. That was a book on Bloomberg Opinion. <laughs> Have you read that? You yeah, that it's a long that? column. Yeah. Can you tell Neil that uh, the columns are short? I and, love his books. column can because, you, you know, he's speaking, about, he's speaking about the fact that there's a meaningful chance that we have conflict between, and I write it about yeah. in my own book, there's a chapter about the new Cold War between US and this revisionist power, and I say it could end up into a okay. hot war. It's a significant risk. I want to go to the past, and I was so pleased that you mentioned on page 37 your colleague, Alberto Alessina. I still can't believe we lost him at such a young age. You two looked at the politics of our economic system, Rubini and Albert, Alberto Alessina. I want to bring it forward to where we are now, which is a massive dollar shortage and central banks. They've got a plan, but they're going to be overrun by a global dollar shortage in EM and, frankly, in developing economies as well. Is there a dollar shortage now? And is that the catalyst for central banks to blink? Uh, it's going to be one of the catalysts. There is a dollar shortage, and the raise in interest rates in the United States is particularly dramatic for EM. They have a terms of trade shock, those that are importing commodities. They have a rise in interest rates because of what the Fed does, and they have their own domestic inflation. And then the weakening of the currency that increases the real value in local currency of their own debt. So for them, it is a perfect storm. Some of them have a lot of reserves. Some of them don't have reserves. Some of them have received IMF money. But there is right now a strengthening of the dollar that is implying even further tightening of financial conditions in the rest of the world. Now, I think that eventually the dollar is going to have to fall very sharply because we have a twin fiscal and current account deficits. In other advanced economies, you have a fiscal deficit, but you have a current account surplus. And now we're essentially using the dollar as a, a tool of national security and foreign policy. We're weaponizing it, rightly so. Sanctions against Russia, against Iran, North Korea, China. We're starting, by the way, a the tech war with China, economic war. This, what will be the sanctions about for dollar weakness? How do we get there? Forget about this plaza. Uh, it's going to go is, left is, is go, is go, is gonna be essentially the Fed wimping out. Once you see a severe recession. What does wimping out mean? That means blinking, right? Yeah, blinking. They're going to blink and wimp out because you'll have a severe recession. Wimp out. That's have a, a new you have a financial term. It's, it's, new be, it's a, it's a yeah. mega threat to yeah. wimp out. <laughs> well, either you're a hawk or you're a wimp and so on, or a dove in this case. Uh, but that's going to happen. And once the Fed is going to essentially prevent an economic and financial crisis or try to prevent it by essentially stop raising rates, even inflation is too high, then the dollar is going to start sharply weaken. That's going to be the trigger for it. A because what's raising the dollar is, of course, the tight monetary policy. A viewer wrote in and wants to know what you're doing with your money, considering that it seems pretty bleak out there. Yeah. You know, do you just stuff it into a mattress? No, you don't stuff it into a mattress because um, then even cash loses money because of inflation. There are three solutions to the problems of inflation, the basement of fiat currency, political and geopolitical risk and environmental risk. Solution number one is to have very, very short-term treasuries that adjust in, in rates and don't have the price action of long bonds that have a 
fall in their price. Secondly, you want to be into tips, even if tips right now have not yet done well because inflation expectations are not yet de-anchored. I think you want to go into gold and precious metal. Again, gold has not done very well because you had tight monetary policy, strong dollar, but if central banks are going to blink and wimp out, gold is going to rise in value. Gold is going to rise in value also because the enemies of the U.S. are subject to sanctions. China now is worried. They have a trillion dollar of reserves in dollar. They have to move to other things. If it's euro and yen, they can be seized. The only thing that cannot be seized is gold, of course, not in the vault in New York or London, but in Beijing or in Moscow and so on. And finally, appropriate types of real estate that are environmentally resilient, because real estate compared to equities in a recession does well, because you have more pricing power for rents and so on. So a combination of these assets provide you, in an optimized way, a hedge against some of these risks. On the flip side, you've always been brilliant on leverage in the system, on credit. Yeah. And we've heard from one fund manager after another that there is resilience in this corporate credit sector, even with the debt that they have, even with the low coupons that they're currently paying that will reset higher. Do you disagree? Do you think that people are overly <coughs> sanguine about the upcoming credit cycle? They are. Right before the COVID crisis, the Fed was writing reports on financial stability, pointing out the leverage of the corporate sector. Of course, high yield and fallen angels. But then during COVID, these folks should have gone bust, but they were bailed out. We bought even high yield debt, you remember, commercial paper and everybody under the sun. So the zombies were bailed out. And the excesses of having leveraged loans, CLOs, Covlite got even worse and people got even more indebted. This time around, the part is over because the Fed, for now, will have to raise rates. Those debt service ratios are going to become impossible. And you get the double whammy for those corporates. You get a PL because income is going to right. fall because of the recession. And you get a debt problem with debt service ratio rising. And therefore, there'll be a corporate debt crisis, one we avoided during the GFC and during the COVID crisis. Right. It's Nor coming now. The CLO and leverage market are shutting down right now. I want to get to Chapter 12, where you yeah. talk about a more optimistic future, yeah. a utopian future. You started by quoting the economist Yogi Berra. I thought that was very good. You go right in there <laughs> about predictions and Yogi in the future and yeah. all that. How do you get from Yogi Berra to a more optimistic future? Well, the more optimistic future starts with essentially technological innovations. Like, for example, I don't think it's going to be renewable. It might be fusion. If fusion happens, then you can have unlimited amount of essentially energy at cheap cost with no greenhouse gas emissions. We look like we are, however, only 15 to 20 years away from fusion becoming <clears throat> a reality. If it comes faster, then we can increase the economic pie. We're going to reduce the cost of energy. We're going to stop greenhouse gas emissions. We can grow more. What about, our fractured, what water. about our fractured political system, whether it's your Italy and the turn there to the right or what we see in the election here coming up in two weeks? How do we get beyond this fractured political system? Uh, for now, we're going towards a world that is even more divided domestically. There's more polarization. There's lack of partisanship. Mm -hmm. And it's happening. I mean, you have authoritarian regimes in power. You have Putin in Russia. You have Erdogan in Turkey. You have Kaczynski in Poland. You have Orban in Hungary. You have Meloni in Italy. You have these Nazi Swedish Democrats now in Sweden. You have the Brexit phenomenon. You have the Trump phenomenon. And in Latin America, it used to be only Venezuela, Argentina, populists of the left. But in the last two years, well, Chile, Ecuador, <coughs> Peru, Colombia, we and gotta, Brazil we is going to be go. either populists of the sold, right or the left. Ten seconds. Bolsonaro, Lula. Sold, That's the world we're going. Unfortunately, no. it's a world that is not liberal democracy. Have you sold the movie rights yet? No, not okay. yet.